So what has been the biggest news on the continent is the Nigerians' election, which is going to be happening tomorrow. And there's a record-breaking 94 million registered voters in Nigeria. What does this mean for both Nigeria and the African continent, given the country's influence in terms of their economic power in the continent? No, it's a, it's a massive election. It's a massive election. You need to remember the larger context uh, around democracy right now. The majority of big elections are, are, are being rigged or at least highly contested in, in democratic like states like the US, there's um, India, you think of Brazil, you think of Russia, right, China. So there's a lot of those what we call illiberal democracy that decide to don't organize elections anymore. And a country like Nigeria being um, the third largest country in the world in terms of population by 2045, that would set a path of democracy, would, would mean a lot for the, the world. It will show that democracy function and it's not just a, a Western things to try to change the, the edit system. There's There have also been more than 10 million young people have registered to vote on this election. What has inspired so many young people? Ah, that's a really, really good question. I can't answer for, for Nigerian themselves. Um, but uh, what we know is, yeah, there's 94 million voters, right, which is more, 10 million more than last time. So a lot of young people have decided to register. Register do not mean that they're going to go and vote. And this is like the big, big, big question for this election. Nigerian election have a really low turnout. So usually it's like 36 percent, 37 percent of people going to vote. So outside of those 94 millions, you really think of half of them will actually go to vote, right? And if you think about it, who is going to go to vote? those that are already in the political parties, those that gain money from the political parties, right? Whatever, they have a job in, in governance or local governance, or they know someone in the party, but that's how those people will always vote, right? So the stronghold of the old party will always be strong. They will always vote for them. They have the money to, to pay and to make sure the elections happen for them. But new candidates have to bring hope. They, have, they don't really have the money to, to tell people, hey, no, uh, here's fifty dollars. Go to vote for me. No, it's it's more complicated. So there is a lot of like polling stations that have been placed all around the country, and there's a third candidate, um, is the OB uh, that is making a lot of noise. And uh, it seems like the youth are uh, the youth are tired of having president in their seventies. The guy is sixty one, and he looks like he's young. So <laughs> in any sort of politics, like that would not happen. 61 years old is not that young. Think of what's happening in Burkina Faso next door or Mali next door. Those leaders are in their 50s, 40s, and even uh, Traore is in his 30s, right? Uh, Thomas Sankara was in his 30s when he took power. Jerry Rowling in Ghana was in his 30s when he took power. So in Nigeria, the youngest candidate is 61. But he has said, that he need to stop police. We need to stop police violence. He have explained. He have spoke directly to the youth, saying that police violence is not a thing, and the, like the party should even apologize. So he's a he's a really he's a new independent candidate. He doesn't really have the deep pocket and the powerful political organization of his rivals, but uh, he seems to have bring some. Uh, he, he he lead on the polls' opinions, um, but once again, like. There's the difference between the election on the day of the election, which is really a political machine. It's it's how your political party will manage to bring people to polling stations so they vote for them. Um, whatever in South Africa, in Tanzania or in Uganda, we know exactly uh, those type of, 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 uh, of things. So the party will deploy a lot of energy to try to make sure people vote for him. But yeah, once again, new candidates can emerge uh, with new ideas and especially if the youth uh, push it to power. And Thomas, given the low amount of cash that is available in the country, how could that be an issue for the voters? And how much influence would the politicians have in terms of swaying people's decision? Yeah, when you when you ask Nigerian right now, that seems to be the number one problem. So uh, some some cities in Nigeria now even use the franc CFA, which is the the, the French uh, the francophone money of in West Africa. Um, there's a low amount of cash due to some new policy from the central bank. It's not really connected to the elections, but some people say that it's uh, it will definitely impact that elections. Basically, there is not so much uh, cash available in the country right now. So a lot of people like lack for cash. And so there's a lack of cash and a lack of, of, of petrol in the country. What that could mean is that people that were trying to travel in order to go to vote, 
because you go to vote in your in your in your state in Nigeria. Um, you can't go to vote everywhere in Nigeria because you have moved. You have to go back to your state. All of those people might not have access to their polling stations. So if some people don't go to vote, it's not because they're less democratic or they don't believe in elections or they're politically like unhappy. It's also because the possibilities of voting are, are really um, complicated. In Nigeria, you vote per state, right? Uh, within your state. And it's, why is it important? It's, it's, you need to go back to the history of the Biafra War and the origin uh, federal like a type of governance. But basically what it means is that a lot of people that are going to vote, a lot of electors are going to make maybe 400, 500, 600 kilometers. And if, if the cash is, if, if there's not enough cash, you can't buy your petrol, you can't bring much, much people inside. Um, but the whole economy is, is going a bit slow and the capacity, especially for the poor to go to vote might be undermined. So now let's okay. move from West Africa to East Africa, where the new season of cyclone has just begun. Tanzania has approved the construction of a pipeline that would allow Ugandan oil to be delivered to international markets, with the Energy Minister January Makamba dismissing environmental concerns about the project as propaganda, and in addition saying that the project will increase Tanzania's influence in the world. And at the same time, Tropical cyclone Freddy made landfall on Madagascar Tuesday evening, killing at least four people as it brought massive storm surges and wind gusts of up to 180 kilometers per hour that tripped off houses. Yes, this is this is absolutely correct. And I think it's important to understand the two things together. Uh, in one hand, what we have is we have the cyclone season that is starting. And what scientists are telling us is that those are the biggest winds that we have recorded at the starting season so far, right? So those cyclones that are coming in the next six to eight weeks are going to be amazingly impactful. They're going to destroy a lot of human habitations and they will, uh, they will ruin a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, people's life. Uh, we think of the fishermen, especially that are on the coastals, but also when the cyclone pass, you often destroy like housing, but not just housing, also like municipalities, also like uh, state services um, and, and schools. And most of the time, like those schools are not even going to be reopened really soon. And, and so you have a lot of uh, drama that comes out of it. So in one end, absolutely devastating cyclone for African societies that is going to kill. We know that that's in the next eight, uh, eight weeks, we're going to report in this channel that there is people getting um, getting under, uh, under those powerful wind and, and dying. And in the other end, um, we have East Africa and Uganda and Tanzania especially uh, that starts new uh, fossil fuel energy projects, right? New petroleum projects. So Total Energy have started new projects in Uganda, in Mozambique and South Africa. And in that case, all the time what they do, what, what we need to understand is that they are going to take the petrol out of African land, right? To transport it outside of, of, of African land in Tanzania, right? With that massive pipeline. Uh, by the way, this is an absolutely like great news for technology optimists. We have a new technology now. The old pipeline is 50 degrees, so it's fantastic. The petrol goes out way faster. It's, uh, it's a bit cheaper for, for, for Total Evan. Um, is it a good news for the people? No, it, it means their resources are leaving faster, right? Um, so then that petrol goes out to the world and is consumed and will transform into carbon within machines that will enrich other people. They will enrich Chinese, they will enrich French, um, they will enrich other people that aren't Africans. But yet, where is the cyclone? Is the cyclone coming in China or is it coming in Europe or is it actually coming to us right now from the Indian Ocean, right? So in one end, we have like a generation of like president that finds it's a good idea to export petrol so it would bring revenue and what, what, what. But in the other end, they have to spend way much more money trying to mitigate the effect of cyclone that will come in. Um, if you know, uh, I know you have some people from Pumalanga in your, in your team, right? Uh, I don't know how old they are, but they must remember the recent years where the wind and the, and the rain was really heavy. Um, now cyclones used to pass by Madagascar and arrive in Mozambique and slow down in Mozambique, slow down in Zimbabwe and never really arrive to South Africa. Now it's, they arrive to South Africa since two or three years now those cyclones, uh, they come, they uh, go as far as Madagascar to Johannesburg. Beautiful, beautiful journey for them. But we also have the aftermath of those cyclones right? because they're so powerful that now they don't reduce when they arrive in land. Normally a cyclone get powerful and powerful in the ocean. And then you reduce when you arrive to land. Those cyclones continue, continue their destructions. It is made because of carbon 
we know that sensitive stuff showed us it's, it's made because carbon there's too much carbon in the atmosphere and um we need to congratulate ourselves from putting more carbon in that atmosphere um i really wonder who's going to win that dev game i hope there'll be a time where africans will start benefiting will start to truly benefit from their natural resources yeah and then the most the best way might be right now to tell them like no we're not selling we're keeping it for ourselves we're keeping it for ourselves the problem of those resources is they they have they have fuel fill other people's projects um they have fuel fill like the industrialization of china they could fill the the chesterization of europe the chesterization of the us they fulfill a lot of different objective uh, that that is energy really useful that have been really useful for other places but not so much for here so over now to west africa thomas sankara a bukina bay leader who has inspired millions of people from across the world really has been reburied at the site of his death what does this mean <laughs> It's a really confusing story if you haven't followed the story because Thomas Sankara is, is dead in uh, 1987, right? So how would he be reburied, deburied, and in, in a new site of his death? Uh, so I'm sure you know there's new power in Burkina Faso. Um, and what it means is that the one that killed Sankara, Blaise Compare, is no longer in, in business in Ouagadougou. So what it means is that um, a new trial has started a uh, few years ago, uh, two years ago, if I'm not mistaken, uh, to now judge who has, has killed Sankara, right? To judge the assassin of Sankara. So they made the investigation. They figured out things that we already knew. Um, it was fine. But at least there were some people that, that there were some names that were put on who assassinated Sankara. In order to prove who assassinated Sankara, the, just, the judges said we need to bury it the we need to bury the body so we see how many uh, bullets are inside the body and 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 all those things right so we do all autopsy and we make sure that the body is the right body because a lot of people are sankara when he was killed he wasn't properly buried so they moved the, the body it's a complicated story but to make to just to understand a judge at the body or not himself right but he has the <laughs> access to the body in order to do medical reports and to say okay does it correlate to the information that the trial is giving me right um so now in the midst of this you have a coup d'etat in burkina right uh a kind of a really really interesting coup d'etat with a really young man that is now the the young the most young the youngest leader of of the world um youngest african leaders of course and he keep quoting sankara quote sankara he quote sankara he quote sankara he speaks of sankara he does what sankara did and more interestingly he really does what sankara did for instance he kick out the french uh that were present military but if you remember sankara never said he, he hated the french you will never find a quote of sankara saying like the french are the problem he, he said in reverse i'm open to receive help from everyone soviet union france germany us or china but don't tell me just to receive help from france and the us because china and russia are not your friends that's not my business so he used to say me i receive help from my people from everywhere and that's what the president said he said he took out he took out the forces He took out the force the french forces he said no it's not your soldiers that are supposed to fight our wars and he started like a militia of of young people he recruited young people that wanted burkina faso sovereignty back so burkina faso is is taking back its sovereignty himself not with the help of a foreign army right um which is totally sankaris the totally sankaris idea so now the tower have asked the french give us the weapons and if the french don't give the weapons Then he was going to ask the Russians, he's going to ask the Chinese, he's going to ask a range of people. But first is the question of where will the weapons come from because they need new weapons to fight the jihad, right? And if you if you if you familiar with with the news, those that are familiar with the news, they will know that the Americans, the French, the Germans right now they send a lot of weapons to Ukrainians. A lot of weapons run out to Ukrainians. Tank, even now like flight jets, Like there's a lot of things that goes to Ukraine. Now what why why can't Europe send similar weapons to the Sahel? Why is it that the Sahel don't have country safe tank to fight the jihadists? Why is it that we can't receive flight jet? But what we can receive is the foreign army coming to our country doing the job for us and then living. Do you understand what's that play? Do you understand what that plays? So so there's that ideology of of sovereignty, right? Um So that's that's a really important question. Now when it comes to the body of Thomas Sankara, that leaders have said no, 
We cannot rebury Thomas Sankara uh, in his previous tomb in a random place in Ouagadougou. We need to to properly like set up a a, a mausoleum for him, some some sort of a, a museum, something something where people can go and 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 uh, you know learn about what happened in Burkina Faso. So they erected a, a big statue of him. Some say it doesn't really look like him. Eh. <laughs> that's uh, that's uh, topics of conversation in Ouagadougou for sure. But he decided to rebury the body where he was killed. So in the Conseil de l'Entente, which is the place where Sankara and, and, and eight of his friends were, were killed, um, he decided to rebury them. And so all the old Conseil de l'Entente now would become some sort of a, a museum in, in, in a, for, 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 for Sankara, right? However, the problem is, I don't know if you can see where the problem comes from, because right now, like, do we care? Do we not care? Whatever is reburied, it's better for him if, you know, it's placed. But now imagine the family. Imagine you are you are Sankara's sister. Imagine you are uh, the family. And now you have to go where he got killed in order to pray for him, in order to visit him, in order to, to do all the, all the traditional uh, things that you have to do, right? Uh, that your culture commands you to do. And you can't really re-go in, in, in the booth late. Like, like people were killed there. There's blood everywhere. And uh, so the family, Sankara family, is absolutely unhappy about it. And they have claimed that that's not what they wanted. They do not want Sankara to be there. They do not want to have to re-come inside and, and relive that trauma again and again and again and again. Sankara was truly one of the best African leaders. And I hope more young people are able to learn from world him. Leader. World no leader. From world him. leader. Top, top, top three world leaders for sure. I think what he has so, done in three years probably take African leaders more than 20 years to be able to achieve. Yeah, yeah, and some of them are here since 45 years, even before Sankara arrived or when Sankara was still in power and they still haven't achieved what he has achieved in a year or two. Problem is what? Like a lot of Europeans, a lot of people think like Africans are incompetent. So that's why they don't want to give them the weapons. They think, ah, if we give weapons to the Burkina, they will end up like killing each other or the weapon will go left and right. We won't control the weapons. They, they don't believe. They don't trust uh, They don't trust your generation to do the right things. And that's where they mistake. That's where they mistake. If they continue to help the older generation and not the younger generation, then they will they will continue to fulfill their own um, their own phantasma of, of what Africa is. But when they give power to the youth and when you empower the youth, then you start to see results. Then you start to see results. So I want to finish with that as, as something that is crossing all of our topics of today. In Nigeria, the youth need to go out. They need to go and vote and tell the oldest guy, like, no, it's, it's not possible. We don't do politics the same way. In Burkina Faso, people need to come out and say, yeah, we have a leader now that respect like Thomas Sankara ideas. And his ideas have still not been implemented in Burkina Faso. Now we're doing it. It's time to do it. It's not a thing of the past. It's time to do it. So all the time, the youth are, are the solution to the equation that we're trying to we're trying to impact. And in addition to that, Thomas, this channel aims to celebrate those who have made a massive impact in our in our times, really. And Thomas Sankara is definitely one of those individuals. And by celebrating him, we hope more young people can be inspired by him and learn from him. Definitely, definitely. I they they should they should. There's great documentary on YouTube. Uh, do you have a lot of speech from Sankara itself? He was in Harlem. He spoke to the Afro-Americans in Harlem rather than going to UN nations. That speech is beautiful. You have the speech in Addis Abeba when you say, wait, wait, wait. If we if we continue to pay the debt, we will have more debt tomorrow. Hey, have you seen the debt being done? No, until today, we, we don't. The debt is growing and growing and growing. So he was, he was right from 1987. It's a fucking long time ago. Um, and uh, yes, we need to, we definitely need to revamp this idea because that's that's the most secure way for the continent to achieve its development. Thomas, thank you for your analysis on what has been happening in the African continent this week. So if you enjoy our content, kindly subscribe so we can bring you more amazing content like this. Thank you. La patrie ou la mort. <laughs>